one who hears you, this is Jesus speaking. He's talking to those he's sending out. The one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me. And the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. This is powerful. This is very strong. Why? Because these are unqualified men. The 72. I mean, we don't have them by name. These are unqualified people, as we would say today. Jesus appoints them, and he looks at them, and he says, Listen, with the message I give you, if, if you do exactly what I told you, he who listens to you, he, he who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Do you get that? Meditate on that for a second. The man that God appoints to, to share his message, if it is scriptural, if it is from the Bible, if it is speaking to you, personal conviction, if you reject that, if you think, I'm going to reject Daniel, I'm going to reject this message, it's not for me, I don't like it, it doesn't, it doesn't suit my needs. Jesus is saying, you don't reject him, but you reject me, because he sent my word and I sent him. And if you reject me, you're rejecting the Father. Do you get the weight of that? Do you see how much, and this is why a lot of pastors fall into pride. A lot of leaders in the church fall into pride. Because they're appointed, and they're gifted. And then they read scripture like this, and then they get puffed up. But I want to tell you something, if God speaks to you, and if I present you the word of God on, on the specific topic, if you reject me, I'm not going to be hurt. I'll assure you that I will not be hurt. But I'll tell you something, you're going to reject him. And if you reject him, you're going to reject the father. That makes obedience, that brings to a whole new level. You can title this message many other things. We can, we can title it culture versus biblical perspective. We can title it this against that. We can call it unhealthy desires. It might be a little lengthy, but I'm just going to title it The Desire Being Rich. I did not want to speak on this whatsoever. The Lord is my witness. I did not want it. I, I, I had wanted nothing to do with it. Even in my notes, I said I would not, I'm not going to speak about this topic before I knew I was going to speak on this topic. And exactly, and the Lord is my witness. I'll call, I'll call him for my witness. But he's placed it on my heart. And I, I just, I just want to bring to light, just in case you aren't familiar with it, but the culture is pressing this idea that you have to be successful, and you have to be a big name. You have to have much. Here's the problem. Not only is that in the North American culture, this comes from many cultures, but to apply it to us, this comes from the Middle Eastern culture as well. There are many good with the middle, there's many things that are good about the Middle Eastern culture. Okay? The people, the language can be intriguing, I don't understand it. The language can be intriguing, you can enjoy the history, um, the food, the people. But we have to embrace that there are negative sides to our culture. And we have to make a decision. If this comes against the Bible, what am I going to stick to? My culture? Or my God. You have a choice. Before God, you have a choice. And this has been embedded in our minds. And I'm going to look at some of the younger people. I'm going to look at you. You've been heavy burdened. Because of this press on your life. Some of you by your parents, I know it. Have been heavy burdened and pressed with a pressure that you shouldn't have from the beginning. It's not biblical. I'm sorry. I'm not going to shy away from it. It's not biblical. In fact, it's dangerous. And we're going to look at how dangerous it is. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to start at verse 5. It's in the middle of a sentence. I'll explain afterwards. And constant friction among people who are deprived in mind and deprived of truth, imagining that godliness is means of gain. But godliness with contentment is much gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. 
But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs, with many sorrows, with many griefs. Now when we look at this in the reading of 1 Timothy, we know Paul has entrusted Timothy in the church of Ephesus, correct? It shouldn't surprise us really that this is a concern, that Paul's pushing this. Because let's look at Acts really quick. Uh, when Paul goes to Acts, I believe this is his second missionary journey in Acts 19. Um, I'll read it from verse 23 to 26. It says, About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business of the craftsmen there. And he called them together, along with the workers in related trades, and said, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how the solo Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. And he said that God's made by human hands are not God's at all. So here we have this concern. Paul is coming in. He's changing everything. And the first thing he says is, look, you guys know we make a lot of money doing this. That's the first concern. We make a lot of money doing this. There's a concern and there's even a connection here that there's some sort of there's some sort of connection that godliness is means of gain. We make a lot of money from this, and, and this has to do even with, with who we worship. And look at I invite you now to look at 5b, if you want to say 5b, the end of 5, verse 5. Imagining that godliness is means of gain. So now you can take this two way. Most likely what he's saying here is that imagining that there's a link that yeah, you pursue godliness for means of gain. That might be true back then. It can be true for prosperity preachers today, but for more ch most churches in North America, this isn't necessarily the case. No one goes into ministry to make money. Just, it's, not, it's not what you do. You go to ministry because you're called. Because you're called by God. That's why. So we can take that perspective and we can see in Ephesus that this was an issue. We don't know if these men were saved, these craftsmen were saved, but even so, if they were, I can, I can tell you that this, this mindset, this understanding of godliness as means of gain would most likely stick on with them. Because this is heavy pressed. Because this is, this is one of the many gods of this age. Money. You cannot serve two of them, though. For you either love one or hate the other. But let's say he's saying here that godliness means a gain, so to say that if you're godly, you'll have much. That can be true, but it doesn't always have to be true. And I, I can share many examples, but for example, Jesus shares a parable um, in Luke 12, talking about the parable of the rich fool. And you can read through it, and you can see that there's a very, very wealthy man, and we even see this today, very wealthy man, but doesn't acknowledge God whatsoever. Right? Just because you have much doesn't mean you're blessed. It doesn't mean it comes from God. And some people argue the case of Esau, how you read in Genesis 36 or 37, how him and his brother had so much that they had to split off from the land because the land couldn't actually provide for them. And then if you read in Malachi chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, I believe, it says, For Jacob I love and Esau I hated. Esau I hated. But look how much he had. You can dive into different interpretations and such. Well, let's look at verse 6. But godliness with contentment is much gain. So if you don't, I want you to pick up, he's, he's doing a play on words almost here. Because he's saying, imagining that godliness is means of gain. But then he's saying, but godliness with contentment is great gain. We're talking two different kinds of gain though. Godliness is means of gain at the end of verse 5. is talking about physical gain. But godliness with contentment is much gain. Different kind of gain. We're not talking about physical gain. And Paul, this isn't a new word to Paul when he's talking about contentment. And most of you will know that. In Philippians 4, if you'd like to look at it, Philippians 4, Paul, Paul brings up the same word. Contentment, being content. I like this definition. Um, 
contentment is an inner sufficiency that keeps us at peace in spite of outward circumstances. I'll say it again. And, uh, contentment is an inner sufficiency that keeps us at peace in spite of outward circumstances. And we see that through Paul. Philippians 4, 11 to 13. I know many of you will know verse 13. Um, verse 11, though, he says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. There's that word. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and, hung and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah, right? This verse doesn't mean that you, can, that you can jump off a building without protection and live. That's not... In context, he's talking about money, possessions. Right? He's talking about possessions. He's saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But he says, I've learned the secret. We need, like, what is the secret, Paul? Like, tell me, what's the secret? That you can have much and you can have just about nothing. Yet you're not shifting. You're not, you're not swaying. What's the secret? I, I, it's in verse 13. Truly being content is not self-sufficiency, but Christ's sufficiency. Look at verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the secret. Being in Him. Not being apart. That's how I can be content. Because I know I have Him. I don't need anything else. I can lose my job. I can get in a car accident and just lose my car. I, I can lose whatever. It doesn't matter because I have Him and I trust Him. I've learned the secret. I know a lot of us need to learn the secret to be holistically depend, dependent on Christ in absolutely every circumstance and every situation to be dependent on Him. That, you know what that means? That means that literally anything can be taken apart from you and you won't change. You won't be altered. You won't be shifted. Dependent. I'll tell you something. You'll really know what you're dependent on when it departs from you. When you lose this or you lose that. You'll know how much it meant when it was pulled away from you. How much effect it had on you. The point of verse 6 here, but godliness with contentment is great gain, is the fact that wealth itself doesn't bring contentment. It doesn't. There are so many verses we can pick from, but Ecclesiastes 5.10, for example, he says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. I, I need you to understand this. I need you to grasp this. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. You get that. The thing that often is pursued after and chased after for means of being comfortable does not satisfy. Uh, we have a delusioned mind and blinded eyes to this idea that money, the more we have, the more comfortable we will be. It's a lie. It's not scriptural. I, I don't find it in my Bible. If you can find it, bring it to me after. But I just don't see that with much we have, the more satisfied we are. As New Testament believers. Yet this is being pursued, and this is where it breaks my heart, not from in the world, not just in the... It's being pursued in the church. The church is chasing after the God that the world chases after. We are called to be a different set of people. The not, not, to, not different people that we come together and meet once, twice, three times a week. That's not the difference. A transformation of the mind. Your thinking has changed. Your understanding has changed. You've grown, you've matured. You've seen and tasted of the world and you said, this doesn't satisfy, I don't need it. But for some reason within the church, we still bring this mentality on with us. And it's damaging. It's not godly and it's very dangerous. And I'm going to look you right in the eye and say, if you're chasing after this, beware. For your own life. For your own walk in the faith. If you think having much money is going to make you comfortable, 
Well, I'll tell you something. You're following a lie. And I don't know where you got this from. I'm very confused where this idea was developed. And I'm, I'm grieved to the fact that this is within the church. That we chase after wealth. And we, it would become, I can't, I cannot, can someone explain this to me? Jesus says, do not worry about your life. Yeah, we chase money in means of not wanting to worry in the future. Where, from where, from where is this idea developed? We chase and we say, so that I won't worry in the future, I want as much as I can have now so I can be ready. But Jesus says, don't worry about it. I will take care of that. But we try to do it on our own means, with our own intelligence, with what we already know, with our own gifts. And I'm sorry, I don't know where this idea was naturally developed. I don't know if it's in the flesh. I don't know if it came, if it was a doctrine formed in, in Hades and it lifted up onto the earth. But it's not for the man and woman of God. The desire of being rich is not for the man or the woman of God. It is not for you if you are in Christ. Now, I want to look at the text before we continue from verse 6. I want to be able to just explain this. I'm not condemning those who are rich, because Paul doesn't do that. And we know that from later on in the text. But I just want to break it down. From verse 3 to verse 5, he's, a, he's addressing false teachers. Okay, So he's addressing false teachers. And then from verse 6 to 8, he's talking about content believers, content Christians, how you should be. From verse 9 to 10, he's talking about believers who are desiring to be rich. And then after, on the same topic of being rich, from 17 to 19, verse 17 to 19, he's talking to those who are already rich. And when you read what he's talking about, those who are already rich, he doesn't say sell everything you have because it's wicked. He doesn't say that. He tells them, be ready to, to give. You've been entrusted with something. Be ready to give it on to other people that are in need. Be rich in good deeds, he says. More than being rich by material wealth. Be rich in good deeds. He doesn't tell them to sell everything. I'm not condemning those who are rich. I'm not, I'm not saying be lazy and don't work. Right? Second uh, uh, Thessalonians 3.10. Paul said, yeah, for he who doesn't, doesn't want to work, for he who doesn't work shouldn't eat. And I'm not saying don't save up. I just want to make sure I lay this out flat. I'm not saying don't save up. Because when we look at 1 Timothy 5, and he's talking about, uh, Paul's talking about, you know, providing for a family. He who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever and has denied the faith. Right? And that might mean you have to save up. But I'm just saying this. Be very careful now. Be very careful. And if you trust Paul's account, we're going to look at it. If you trust Paul's words, I mean, we trust him with about just everything else. But if you don't trust him here, I would ask you to examine your heart. But he says, many have swayed away from the faith. And we're going to look at that after. Well, let's look at verse 7. For we have brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. See that? Wealth isn't lasting. It doesn't last. We brought nothing into the world, and we can't take anything out of it. Just as someone else once said, we brought nothing into the world because we actually can't take nothing out of it. The fact that you came into this world without a cell phone and a laptop and this and that, shows the fact that you're going to leave with nothing. And this is, to the Jewish people, not an unfamiliar proverb, not an unfamiliar teaching. And I want to look at, first I'll look at Psalm 49. Psalm 49, I'm going to jump around, I'm going to start at verse 10. He says, for he sees that even the wise die, the fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. And leave their wealth to others. Verse 16. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. Listen to this. For though while he lives, he counts himself blessed. And though you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go to the generations of his father who will never again see light. Let's look at Job. Job chapter 1 verse 21. After Job loses his family, after he loses his stuff, 
He says the exact same thing that Paul says. He says, naked I came, verse 21 of chapter 1. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Naked I started, naked, naked I go. I started with nothing, I'm going to leave with nothing. Ecclesiastes. Exact same thing. I'm sorry, you're jumping all around. But Ecclesiastes 5.15 as he came from his, mother, his mother's womb, so he shall go again. Naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil, that he may carry away in his hand. Naked as he came, and shall nothing for his toil take away with his hand. His toil, his hard work. This is Solomon. Let's, let's traditionally keep this to Solomon as the author. Time and time again. See, our life as based through Scripture is a very brief uh, pilgrimage or journey with both ends in nakedness, with nothing. Understand this. I started with nothing. I'm going to leave with nothing. I'm going to leave with nothing. My fear is that so many people in the church are going to leave with absolutely nothing. And it's possible. You want to know how I know? 1 Corinthians 3. When Paul talks about this to the church in Corinth. Look at this. Chapter 3. Verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, and, be, and because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that someone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burnt up, he will suffer loss. Though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. The imagery here is literally that fire bumps, jumps up, burns everything, and just misses the man. Like it just misses him. Gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw. I like how Leonard Ravenhill put this. Now, you get this. Wood, hay, straw is above the eye. It's above the ground, sorry. It catches the eye. Wood, hay, straw is above the ground. It catches your eye. Gold, silver, precious stone is below the ground. You can't see it. I just want to reassure you, just in case you forgot, what you can see, touch, and grab as possessions, as things, um, will not go with you. Just in case you put your heart on the things of the earth. I just want to, I just want to reassure you, just in case you, if your mind has slipped past reality, it's not going with you. Your car, your house, whatever, wherever you store your treasure, there your heart will be also. That's what Jesus says, right? So where do you put treasure? It takes time, energy, and work to get. Where do you put your time, energy, work? Is it all just means of gain? Is it all just means of building an account? With very carnal minds, we stay in the church. Not growing. We don't move past this. And I don't understand why people within our culture aren't getting this. How I can share this with, with people within the Canadian culture, they understand. But when I share it before Arabs, they look at me, and, they, and with a stiff neck, they look at me. Affected by their parents, by false teaching, that isn't of the word. I've had people within the Middle Eastern culture, not just Jordanian, I'm talking about, I'm talking about Armenians and so, that have actually sat me down, and I want you to take this to heart, that have actually sat me down, Hearing that I'm doing a bachelor's in theology, knowing that with my degree I can preach and do this and that, I'm entrusted. And they've sat me down, family, family and close friends have sat me down and looked me straight in the eyes and said, how are you going to provide for your family? So, so brainwashed within the church with a false understanding and a false idea that one man's life is all about his possessions, all about what he has. 
Can I, can I tell you, if there's any parents in here that are pushing your kids for good paying jobs, for this and that, for the means of being comfortable and being, being wealthy, I, I wish that you would instead push your children to this understanding. I wish to do this as myself, to look at my, look at my children in the future and say, listen, find God's will for your life and just do it. Just find God's will for your life and just do it. Don't delay. We are living in a time of absolute darkness. Where now we call evil good and good evil. Where we call sweet bitter and bitter sweet. Where we call light darkness and darkness light. Like, who cares about how much money you make? Just find God's will for your life and just do it. We are running out of time. The hour is getting late. You believe that? Or you just read it? The hour is getting late. Yet our minds, we come to church and our minds are still in the world. And we sit in the church and then we think about, you know, oh, God's so good, God's great. And when we leave our minds, we become carnal all of a sudden. And we have carnal thoughts and carnal means of gain. We don't think of the things of God after we hit school and we're hanging out with friends. We forget all about it. Okay, there's verse 8. Timothy chapter 6. But if we have food and clothing, these will be content. Oh my goodness. Paul, you're doing way too much now. Way too much. <laughs> with food and clothing, with these will be content. Yeah, thanks. I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> with food and clothing, with these will be content. Now, if you look at that more literal translation, with nourishments, and with coverings is the word. This is plural. It's most likely it's not talking about um, just clothing. It's talking about shelter as well. And I'll assure you, most likely Paul's getting this from Jesus' teaching. When he says, do not worry. Food, clothing. It's most likely easy enough from that. But look at this verse. This is addressing believers. These aren't super, super believers. These aren't crazy. These, these are believers, okay? These are everyday believers he's instructing. But if we have food and clothing, with these we'll be content. That's it. If I have a house, if I have my basic needs, with this I'll be content. We have lost a sense of contentment within the church. Because we always need a new thing. We always need a new invention. We need the new, we need this, we need a new car, I need this. It's just more comfortable. We've forgotten how to be content within the church. And we forget that there's a dying world looking at us and seeing no difference in our thinking. I wish every church would have, would have a nice board at the door frames of every church and say, you are now entering the mission field to keep our perspective aligned. You're now entering the mission field. Because we forget. But I want, I want to share with you, with food and clothing, with food and covering, with these will be content. Now, are you, are you thankful for, for the food you have? This is very basic needs, but I want to assure you, I was almost tempted to, to not preach on this section, but preach on to the rich, because I think we're very wealthy. And we say, yeah, yeah, we're very wealthy and walk along. But think about it. Think about it. if you brought a Hebrew man, let's say you brought Paul from the first century, the Apostle Paul, and you showed him that you can walk over to that room, flip a thing, and water flows out of it. And you can choose whether it's cold or hot. Think about this for a second. The fact that you can open a fridge, a freezer, side by side. Like this, do you think about this? Or are you just so blessed that you just don't even regard, you don't even think about it anymore? Do you know how to be thankful with what you have? I'll tell you something God loves is a thankful heart. It's someone who's thankful. When we talk about do not be anxious about anything in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving. There's always a sense, there's always a sense of being thankful, even when you're anxious. And we'll talk about that on Sunday. But I invite you to look at the Old Testament and see how God dealt with wicked nations. Now when a land was abundantly wicked, when we see Israel, when we see other nations that are very wicked, God would curse the land with famine. And we live in a day where wickedness abounds. 
far greater than any other time. Where in broad daylight we murder, we steal people as means of sex, as objects. We live in a generation and a time where we frown upon adultery and rape, yet with open arms we consume pornography that depicts both and worse. We live in a time that is abundantly wicked, yet I assure you, you'll go home tonight and you'll have food. Are you thankful for that? Are you thankful that God has granted you peace? Food? Clothing? But we have so much that we don't even acknowledge. We look at our food, thank you God, amen, you know, or uh, grace. And we go about not even acknowledging, not even grateful, not content whatsoever. We lost a sense of being thankful with the very daily needs because we have so much adding on top of it. Verse 9 and 10. Let's look at verse 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Okay. Parents, if you push your children to, to grow to love money, if this is for anyone, if you push them to, to have a good paying job, that they would be comfortable. I'm going to be gentle, and I'm going to encourage you. There are many things Paul's listing here, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin. There's a list, and if you're pushing your kids to do this, I'll tell you exactly what you're doing. You have all this, what Paul's saying, senseless, harmful desires that plunge people into ruin. You have them all in a hallway with the door closed. And this is what you're doing. You're saying, now, I'm just saying, it's not coming, I believe it's not coming out of harmful desire. It's not coming out of harmful, harmful intent. You don't intend to send your children into a pathway that leads to destruction. Good intent. Not biblical, though. I'm just. I'm going to be straight up, and I'm going to be. I'm. I'm not going to hesitate. It's not biblical, and we put pressure on our younger generations to be a big shot. And if they don't meet that needs, then that very person that you build them up to being as they know themselves crumbles, and we have people falling into depression. Worry, anxiety, it's happening. I beg that you would open your eyes. I beg that some of you would talk to your children. But I want to show you how what Paul's talking about isn't just senseless, harmful desires. It's actually, it's actually the devil. You're opening them up for a whole new spectrum of attacks. You're opening them up to the devil himself. When it says here, I want you to notice it, into a snare, verse 19. How do we know that? Because when Paul talks to Timothy in both, both First and Second Timothy, he addresses a snare having to do with Satan. And I invite you to look at it. In First Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. When Paul is talking about qualification of an overseer within the church, he says this, Moreover, he must be well thought out by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Not convinced, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. Now he's addressing the same person. He's addressing Timothy in the same church. He's saying the same thing. So when he says snare here, we're just going to be consistent in how Paul is teaching. He's talking of the devil. 
So what you had good intention to lead your children in or what you had good intention to go for your career or such, you can be walking right into a trap, into a snare of the devil. A snare where you get choked. Where it says plunge people into ruin. Do you know what that means? The image of being plunged into ruin is, is the picture of a man drowning. You want you get a picture of a man drowning. He trusted in his possessions and sailed along. Then the storm came and he sank. That's the image Paul is giving. Plunged into ruin. He's not talking, I want to make sure we, I emphasize, emphasize this, he's not talking to the rich. He is not talking to the rich because he addresses them later. He's talking about those who desire it, those who want it, those who want to be comfortable. But he that will to be rich. Look, 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 at, the, look at the play on, on words. But those who desire, singular, to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, and into many senseless and harmful desires. What once was one desire became many. One, one desire becomes many harmful things following. I just want to be comfortable. Great. So you accumulate wealth and you accumulate possessions. Now you're puffed up with pride. You're puffed up with conceit. You're greedy, selfish, self-concerned, ignorant. See how it grows and it becomes many different things? I like the personification that God gives in Genesis when he talks to Cain on sin. He gives a personification. If you don't know what personification is, he gives something that isn't a human, person-like characteristics. And when he looks at Cain, he says, hey, hey like, be careful. When he's, when he's having, the, when, before he kills his brother, he says, for sin is crouching at the door. Sin isn't standing at the door. He's not standing at the front gate uh, of, of your life, at the front, the strongest part. He's not just standing there looking at you like, he's crouched. You know what that means? That means you go to look through the people and you go look, you're like, mm, this looks safe. And he's saying, be careful. Be very careful. Look, examine. Examine your own heart. You say, I want to save up for my family. Examine that. <coughs> this is how we're going to examine it. I ask you to close your eyes and think of your future. What did you think of? Hmm? You think about a big house with a couple cars and a nice family? With a degree under your belt? Can I ask you, it's not harmful, it's not a bad thing, but can I ask you, did you think anything of God? That sin that you might be struggling with and you have for years. Did you, did you consider actually being set free and growing and moving past that and maturing in your faith? Did you think of the advancement and the growth within your own church here? Or is it all about yourself? This will test your heart. What did you think about? I can tell the way some of you guys are looking at me. You say, hey, don't smile, don't budge, don't do anything. He's going to know. But, I, you know, you know. And God knows. You know your heart. Examine it. And be very, very, very careful. For sin is crouching at the door. And is willing to master over you. Look. Examine. Think now about it. You might have one desire. And you might say, it's just to provide for my family. But I'm saying it will become many. If you're not careful. You don't think the devil's clever? How it'll trick you? Verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that many have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many sorrows. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I'm going to assume that if you're wandering away from something, you must have been walking accordingly. If I wander on my journey home, well, I must have been walking towards my home if I wandered away from it. And if you trust Paul's account, it seems like Paul is talking about something he knows, like he knows of people, and he's saying, look, many have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many sorrows. Um, let me ask you a quick question. Who here 
has heard the gospel of Christ, lift your hand. Glory, look at your hands. Who here accepted it with joy? You received it with joy? Awesome. I'm going to read a parable for you. <clears throat> parable of the sower. He says, listen, Luke chapter 4, I'm oh, sorry, Mark chapter 4, verse 3, I'll start. He says, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell along, along the rocky ground, where it did have, where it had much, didn't have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seed fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has an ear, let him hear. Then he explains it. And we're just going to look from, from the verse 16 of the same chapter when he talks about who had no root. And these are the ones that are sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Now I hear that you guys are doing evangelism. This is very good. It's a good practice. It's a good thing to do. We've been not just suggested, we haven't been suggested to do it. We've been commissioned to do it. We've been entrusted to do it. The work of God. Let me ask you something really quick. Um, if you, when sharing the gospel, think of you in your school, think of you in your work, if you're hesitant and you're scared and you're scared what people are going to think, which is common, if you're scared what people are going to think, uh, you're nervous to do it, you're, I don't know, let me ask you something. How are you going to do it when someone's holding an AK-47 pressed against your forehead? If you can't stand up when there's absolutely no persecution, why do you think you're going to stand up when there is? And I'll tell you something. It's coming. Persecution is coming. And if you can't stand up now, what makes you think when someone comes running at you, when you feel the cold metal of a barrel pressed against your head, what makes you think you're going to say the name of Jesus? If you can't say it freely, boldly, now, when there's no pressure. Many of us deceive ourselves, saying, when, when, well, when it comes, I know that I'm going to stand firm. Now, I just want to tell you, if this word isn't number one in your life, when persecution comes, this word won't be number one in your thoughts. Okay? If you have no root now, if you, if you have no devotion, that's right. We have no root. We have no devotion. You don't have your own strong, personal, intimate relationship with the Lord. And you're dependent on other people, which is good. Work with other people. But if you don't have your own deep, personal relationship with the Lord, do you really think you're going to stand up to that? Someone comes running after you and saying, if you don't deny that name, I'm going to kill your whole family. This happens. What are you going to do? Do you have root? So we can say right here, who here has endured persecution, life-threatening, so to say? Lift your hand if you have. Okay, so how do we know who has deep root? How do you know you're not going to deny it? Do you have root? I'll tell you something, as he continues, when he starts talking about the grain soil on good ground, it starts to produce plentifully, and it starts growing. The one sown on rocky ground, one amongst the thorns. This is your choice. It's not your, just your disposition. It's not like God planted you by thorns and said, oh yeah, you're going to choke. Yeah, that's your choice. That has to do with your relationship with God. That determines if you're on rocky ground, if you have no depth. And look at what he says here. And if you don't trust Paul for some reason, I hope you with Jesus, because he says, an other sown among the thorns. And those who hear, those are the ones who hear the word. But the cares of the world 
and the deceitfulness of riches. And the desires of other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. The deceitfulness of riches. How many more warnings do we need before you see how destructive this ideology is? Marrying rich. Who told you that this was okay? Who told you that the idea of having much for yourself and hope, who told you that? Where did you get that from? Because I'm looking at the scriptures, and from what I see here, and I'm telling you, it doesn't look good. And I don't know where this is built up. And the reason why I'm working really strong against it is because believers, after they come outside of the church after the Sunday, I've seen and heard it where they mingle with people of the world, and their conversation is the exact same. Their desires are the exact same. What's the difference? You come to church, that's it. But your desires are of the flesh, they're of the world. You look exactly like who you want to be with. As soon as you're with Christians, you look like Christians. As soon as you want to look like the world, as soon as you're in the world, you look exactly like them. Is that what God called you to? For a low standard level Christianity like that? Is that what Christ died for? Is that the dirty church that he's coming back for? Where we deliberately know the truth and we say, I don't want, I don't want it, you know, like this is just too hard, you know, I just, I would rather be more comfortable, I'd rather do this on my own strength, on my own means, on what I know already. But the Old Testament warns us continually about this. We looked at Ecclesiastes 5.10. Where he said, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money. You get that? Money is addictive. If you don't believe it, just go down to wherever your local casino is. I mean, those are packed. And, and I've never seen a casino parking lot empty. He who loves money will never be satisfied with money. If you think you're going to be satisfied, stop deceiving yourselves. Read the scriptures. Proverbs 28.20. I'm not going to explain it. But it says, a faithful man will abound with blessing. But whoever is eager to be rich, once again... But whoever is eager to be rich, just in case you were listening, but whoever is eager to being rich will not go unpunished. Whether you want to think this is eternal punishment or not, you'll punish yourself here. Because often when we see people running to psychiatrists and we see people running for, for, for help because they have mental uh, strain, usually it's the rich. I see interviewing this person here, there, that are struggling, that are mentally weak. You bring it on yourself. It's not a desire of God. And I'm sorry, but it's been pressing against me for so long and I can't ignore it. For the parents, I just want to say this. God is calling you deeper. This, it might sound general. But He's calling you back to that secret place. He's calling you back to get alone with Him. He's calling you to, to part from, from your husband, from your wife, and to get alone with him and come back later, like Paul says. But you need the devotion back. And here, as, as anointing oil is applied to the head and flows down to the rest of the body, so it should be in your own household. That the desire for reading the scriptures and searching after the will of God. The love to being with Him begins with you in the household and should flow down to your children. We looked at a lot of scripture. So we shouldn't desire to be rich. Well, what should we desire for? Well, I'll tell you something. In context of being rich, in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7 to 9, this is what I grasp, this is what I hold. Not a lot of people like me talking about this topic, that's why I did not want to share. Chapter, chapter 30 of Proverbs, verse seven to nine. Two things I ask you, Lord, do not refuse me before I die. One, keep falsehood and lies far from me. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise I may have too much and disown you. 
and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. If there's something you want to pray for in the context of riches, look at that. Think about verse 9. Think about the beginning of verse 9. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Do you ever think of that being a possibility? That you would have too much and disown God and absolutely just forget about it. And you say, who, who is the Lord? That's a reality. And this happens. Where people receive much and fall away. I mean, Paul is saying that. Swaying away from the faith. After pursuing this desire. Do you care that you can actually accumulate so much to the point that you forget God? Doesn't that matter to you? Don't you want to guard yourself against that? Forget about being comfortable. I want you. I want your will. I don't care whoever looks at me and says, how are you going to provide for How are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? If I'm in the will of God, I don't want to be anywhere else. I don't want to be anywhere else. So what should we actually pursue then? Luckily, he tells us. Look at verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, in context of Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, O man of God, but we can apply to you, O woman of God, flee these things. Boy, if you didn't get enough of this, I don't know when you are going to. Flee from these things. Like, depart. Run away from it. It's not of God. Flee. This is a warning. When Jesus says a, says a parable of the rich fool in Luke 12, He says, be on your guard. Be careful. Guys, there are warnings in the scriptures that are warning us to this desire that has gripped the church. I'm not talking about the world. It's gripped the church. And He says, flee. Like, run away from His mentality and His ideology. Pursuing riches. Then he says, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. What should you pursue? There it is. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. If you want to pursue riches, and you want to fight against that, temptation, that desire. I would encourage you to write these down and put it up against your wall. And every time you have the thought, even so, whenever you have the worry, because a lot of people, because they can't meet that need of obtaining all the riches, begin to worry. And it becomes a source of worry. I would write these down. I would nail it if I had to on my wall. And I would say, Lord, I want to pursue these. Above all. And I'll call the worship up I will conclude now. I'm going to look out one last section in the Bible. Um, you don't have to open to it. Before I do, just in the context of desiring to be rich, um, it's come to my attention, not here, but it's come to my attention that people within the church ask God for riches. God, would you make me wealthy? Jesus says something interesting in the Gospel of Matthew. He says, which of you, if his son asks for bread, would give him a stone? Even so, which of you, if your son asks for a fish, would give him a snake? But let me ask you a question. If your son asked you for a snake or for a stone, thinking that it was good, would you give it? I remember Halloween many, many, many years ago. I remember um, we had a lot of houses. We have a lot of houses in our neighborhood. We go with garbage bags, literally trick or treating, getting candy, this and that. Anyways, I remember once coming home, young kid. Dropped all my stuff in my, <coughs> dropped my bag in my room. Went downstairs, came back upstairs. I was looking around and uh, 
My dog. Little Chico. <laughs> got in the bag, the garbage bag. And I saw the garbage bag moving. I thought it was a demon or something. <laughs> Anyways, he comes crawling out. And he has a little piece, I still remember it. It was an arrow, a little small chocolate bar in his mouth. I remember looking at him and I was like, hey, I go down to take it. Like, no, give it to me, give it to me. And then he, he as soon as you touch it, he goes, Rrr, and just growls. <laughs> And I remember, I don't know what I was thinking, I remember actually getting down to my, my knee to look at this dog in the face. And I looked at him like, you idiot. What he, what he thought was good for him, and what he enjoyed, and what he desired for, would be the very thing that would kill him. And I believe the same thing is happening in the church today, where we're asking for something, and we're saying, God, this would be good, I can use it for good, I can use it for this and that. But God's saying, I'm not giving it to you because that very thing you're asking for will kill you. It will turn around and bite you. The last, last portion of text we're just going to look at is in, Luke, is in Matthew 17. It's the transfig transfiguration. I was in my room yesterday, I believe, or the day before. And I, was, I did not want to read it. Something was saying, don't read it, don't read it, don't read it. And I was like, you know what, I think I need to read this. So I went to go read it, and I'm just going to read it to you. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led him up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And he was still speaking, when behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from, a, from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, I want, I want you to just put yourself in this situation. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came, touched them, and said, Rise, and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Boy, was I in absolute fear when I read this. Look at the power behind. You get to see the, the, the whole deity here. You get to see the beauty and the majesty of Christ. But what really got my attention is verse 2. And he was transfigured before their face, and his clothes, and his face was shone. And then Peter said something that gripped my heart. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents. What about him? What about James? What about John? And I'll tell you something. Before asking for riches and before asking for these carnal things, if you experience the true, the true presence of God, you are not going to think about yourself. Lord, it's good that we are here. You can see Peter almost wanted to stay here. Let's pitch tents. I will pitch tents if you will. One for you, Moses, Elijah. What about themselves? There's absolutely no thought given to himself. Why? Because he has the presence of God. And if he has the presence of God, guys, you don't need anything else. The church doesn't need anything else today. If you have the absolute true presence of God, you will say, Lord, I don't want this to depart from me. I don't care if I sleep outside. I don't care if I'm in a home. I don't care if I have a car. But oh God, would your presence stay? I would pitch tent that you would lodge here, that you wouldn't depart. I, this is good. No thought given about himself, about his own desires. No thought given about him sleeping comfortably. I'll sleep outside as long as you don't depart. And that's what will happen if you encounter the true presence of God. Where no thought is given about yourself. You don't care about your future. As long as God is there. I don't care what I have. I don't care what the world says I'm lacking. Or the church even says that I'm lacking. I'm literally not going to give thought. As long as I have your presence. That it wouldn't depart. This has to be your heart cry. In the midst of a dying world, I don't know what is going to grip you. I don't know what's going to keep you 
grounded? What's going to keep you rooted if it's not the true presence of God? I don't know what else is going to sustain you. I can't advise you to do anything else. But find Him. By all means. Forget about school. If it's going to cost me the presence. Forget about, my, forget about my family if they're advising me elsewise. If they're telling me this isn't, this isn't for you, you don't need to do this. Don't lose the presence. Don't lose the hunger. That's all the devil wants to do. He wants to suck it out of you if he can. Many of us have what I like to call polluted secret places. With a secret place that's lost its holiness. Jesus said, when you pray to the Father, get alone. Yet when we're alone, we're looking at pornography. We're polluted with Facebook and social media. Jesus said, when you're alone, speak to Him. And we're alone, we don't do that. That's when the very sin in our lives comes alive. Seek Him. Forget about riches. Get alone. Just say, God, I don't want to lose anything. I don't want to lose the presence. God, I, I might have let it slip, but would you rekindle it? Let it grow and fire up within me, burning anything that isn't of you. That's what we need, church. More than anything else, the church doesn't need anything else but the real, authentic presence of God. Forsake your desires, forget about it. Seek Him. So Lord, we come before you. We thank you for the, the, the true touch of your word. God, we thank you for how you speak. And Lord, just as your glory was manifested before a couple of your disciples, God, would we experience it? Not letting anything come between it. Lord, we don't need anything else. The church has exhausted herself, trying to do it with entertainment, trying to do it with wealth, trying to do it by other means. But God, we're coming back to the, to the basics. God, we need your touch in this time. Your church has lost holiness. She's lost her persevering. She's forgotten how to pray. God, would you come and bring a burden? Lord, we want to change anything. If you've exposed anything to anyone here, even myself, God, would you give us the strength to change it? Oh, God, would your presence fall richly? Jesus. Would you be in our midst? Would we not leave the word that you've given to us after we sing song? But would we hold it tightly to our heart? Would we hold it close to us, Lord? That we would seek your face now, confessing sin, confessing evil and dangerous desires, and saying, God, if you want to change anything, come and change. We give glory and praise unto you. In the name of Jesus, we pray.